My name is Alon Avidan, and I am a neurologist at uh, UCLA. I'm sorry, the, the slides advance uh, automatically, which is probably a good idea because I, I have 25 slides and I have 15 minutes. So uh, most patients call me Dr. Adivan, and that's why I think I went into sleep medicine. But I'm going to talk to you about RBD, Ramsey Behavior Disorder. How many of you um, treat patients with RBD? Can I see a show of hands? Excellent. How many of you here are sleep physicians or are interested in sleep medicine? Wonderful. So briefly to go into the clinical semiology of RBD, um, patients experience, and again, maybe we need to find out uh, why this is automated. So pardon me for one second. And here it is. Here's the lesion. I'm so sorry. No problem. All right, perfect. So thank you, Amanda. So the patients are in REM sleep. They're in rapid eye movement sleep. They have a sudden arousal. And the next thing that, that happens is they have a complex uh, behavior, generally dream enactment that you see on the third, um, on, on point number three. And then just after that, um, they can, during the episode of dream enactment, they can in, um, experience significant injury. Generally speaking, um, patients have, or they show up to clinic after a, they injure themselves. That's really the one thing that I see clinically when patients present uh, to their um, office, to, to the physician's office, is after they have a significant dramatic episode that brings them to clinical attention. The episode lasts for about 30 seconds, and the patients which go back to baseline. They have no recollection. Well, generally speaking, they may have some fragmentary recollection, but most patients um, generally have a, a, a vivid uh, uh, recollection of something that was trying to hurt them, and the patient was trying uh, to protect themselves during the episode. This is just a differential of all complex nocturnal behaviors um, during a 24-hour period. Now, we're mostly interested in episodes that occur during rapid eye movement of sleep. And you know that REM sleep is usually at higher percentage in the early morning hours. So if I see a patient with possible RBD, a supportive clinical feature is that the episodes occur in the early morning hours. If someone tells me about uh, an episode or a nightmare episode that occurs at 1 or 2 in the morning, I'm more likely to think about the disorder of arousal, like a sleep terror type episode. Restless leg syndrome uh, is an urge to move the lower extremities, usually in the evening time, usually gets better with movement and gets worse with inactivity. But surprisingly, I see folks who read about RBD and then they read about RLS and they think they have a risk for neurodegenerative disease because they confuse between the two or they misspell uh, RLS and they put RBD and then they come in worried they may have Parkinson's disease 10 years later. So when we're talking about uh, parasomnias, we're mainly concerned about disorders of arousal, we're concerned about REM parasomnias, and we're specifically in the REM parasomnias, we're concerned about things like REM nightmares which are very common in children, usually also in REM sleep, but do not involve the motor complexity that you have with RBD. RBD is a disorder that generally affects older men, above age uh, 50 generally, um, and this is the, the phenotype that is usually um, associated with uh, neurodegenerative disease later in life. I want to go over four C's about RBD. If you don't remember anything about this course, I want you to remember that there are four C's. The first C is doing a consultation when you see the patient. And have the bed partner in the room or on the, on, on the speakerphone so you can um, get the historical context for the behaviors. Um, you need to corroborate it with a diagnostic polysomnogram. In fact, this is the only parasomnia for which a sleep study is absolutely necessary for diagnosis. <laughs> Treatment is 
almost 90% effective with clonazepam, that's the third C, and the fourth C is having a conversation with the patient. Once you di diagnose the patient with RBD, you want to talk about the potential for neurodegenerative disease later in life, because we, we know that most patients who have RBD will convert to an alpha synucleinopathy, either diffuse slowly body dementia, multiple system atrophy, or uh, Parkinson's disease. So having this in mind, let's take a look at the first C, having a consultation. Too concerned about it. Well, he fights in his sleep, his arms punch and hit, and his, he also runs with his legs under the covers real fast. And uh, he clears the bedside table, the lamps, the alarm clock, that all goes off. And three times he's thrown himself out of bed and is sound asleep and doesn't wake up till he hits the floor. So and see, the reason the why I'm uh, showing this video is she's the one who provided the historical context that this gentleman has RBD. He has no clue what's going on during the night. He's not suffering from any sleep problem like insomnia or hypersomnia. She's the one with the sleep disorder. She is the one who is scared sleeping next to him because he's always fighting and being aggressive and she's afraid for being, for being hurt. So whenever you see this patient, the first thing is to remember to involve the bed partner, to corroborate the clinical history that this is in fact an elaborate uh, complex nocturnal behavior that is dream enactment, right? And if you can get the bed partner, make sure to call, if you, d you don't have them physically in the room when you interview the patient, make sure to give them a call on their cell phone or put them on a speaker phone uh, or have another family member available to provide this history. All right, let's move on to corroborate. Corroborate means to reveal that in fact what you're seeing clinically dream enactment behavior is in fact supported by sleep studies showing augmentation, elevation of the electromyographic tone in either the chin or the limbs while the patient is being evaluated. This is in fact the only parasomnia for which a sleep study is absolutely necessary because you need to demonstrate lack of EMG at, uh, atonia when the patient is being evaluated and remember, REM sleep, the muscle, so, the muscle tone is, is completely paralyzed. In RBD, it's augmented. So patients act out their dreams, but they're expressing the behavior of the hallucination uh, while dreaming. So REM sleep without atonia is, in fact, the bioassay that we're looking for. This is the sign on the polysomnogram that goes along with a dream enactment behavior. And what kind of dreams do they have? Well, they're not pleasant dreams. The vast majority, over two thirds of the patients with RBD, have a dream in which they're being attacked by an intruder, by animals, by reptiles, by insects. They're never dreams in which the patient is the aggressor. They're just the dreams in which a patient has to protect themselves against an intruder. In, in that process, they punch, they kick, they scream, and they hurt people who sleep around them. Uh, very few people have adventurous dreams. I've had some patients who dream that uh, they're playing golf and, and swing the bat and hit their partners. Uh, and you notice that in less than 3% are the patients the primary aggressors during the dream sequence. All right. Let's talk about treatment. The management of REM sleep behavior disorder, I think, is the most important issue to consider. And why is that? Well, this is the reason. She is a patient with RBD. She flew out of her bed, uh, hit the dresser, and suffered a basilar skull fracture. She is a patient of Dr. Schenk, Carlos Schenk, who was a, is actually credited with a discovering RBD back in 1986. Um, and making it into a distinct parasomnia. So um, you can see she suffered a basilar skull fracture. She has a zygomatic fracture. 
um, raccoon eyes, broken teeth. This is a dramatic episode that resulted in significant injury. And what I'm seeing clinically is the number one reason why patients come in for clinical evaluation is after an episode like this. Typically speaking, they may have a nightmare, they may have, a, you know, they perceive it as a nightmare, they may have a hallucinatory episode. It doesn't really bother them. They think that they're having, um, you know, this, this is just a, uh, a, a, an unusual nightmare and they don't really get clinical evaluation until they hurt themselves or until they hurt, they hurt their bad partner. And the bad partner says, you know, it's, it's time to get an evaluation by, by a physician. Now, on the other hand, when you're seeing physicians in a community who are not familiar with RBD, the stories I'm hearing is that um, they often dismiss RBD as just being a simple nightmare, attributable to something they ate the night before, uh, you know, related to maybe, um, you know, this is probably because you're too stressed or it's related to sleep deprivation. But they often miss a diagnosis of RBD. Interestingly, you know, when I uh, went through immigration uh, through the Vancouver airport uh, yesterday, the person, the officer asked me when I gave him the passport, he says, so what brings you to Vancouver? I said, it's, it's business, I'm, I'm going to lecture at the American Academy of Neurology. And he says, what are you lecturing about? And I said, I'm, oh, it's about uh, this parasomnic called RBD, Ramsey Behavior Disorder. He says, that's, you know, I, I heard this is the parasomnia in which people act out their dreams, isn't it? I said, how did you know? He said, well, I saw another neurologist. I, I asked him the same question. So I think the rates of diagnosis in the Vancouver immigration area is probably going to be very high compared to what we see in clinical practice. But this is, in fact, a parasomnia that is often undiagnosed, untreated, and often uh, by the time we diagnose these patients, it's, it's often after they, they experience an injury. So um, just to show you, um, oftentimes we, we see patients who go through unusual measures to self-treat their RBD. This is a patient I saw not too long ago who um, used a, ha a, a set of seat belts and a handcuff to restrain himself from acting out his uh, dream enactment. And uh, he was a, a prisoner in, in his own bed, essentially, because he was Went unable the bed. to. Uh, he le let's start from the very beginning so I can give them a little context. So the, the movie shows his wife and the patient talking about the environment she went, in which he slept in. So let's start this from the beginning, if possible. And I'm going to go back. All right, and now we're going to have the volume. He felt so up. awful that he made a seatbelt that went around the bed. He restrained his wrist. He, res he literally hogtied himself at night. This is how John used to go to sleep. Wrists and feet restrained, his body tied down. The dangerous thing is I was getting out of bed, maybe attacking my wife, and to realize that I had no control over it, like a... Dr. Jekyll and uh, Mr. Hyde. So the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde syndrome is another term that is often used to characterize RBD. The patients often are very gentle, very relaxed individuals, very pleasant during the day, and during the night they become very aggressive as they're fighting out um, and, and acting out their dreams. So the dichotomy in the clinical presentation is what earns RBD the term the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde syndrome. So let's move on uh, just to summarize that the treatment for RBD should always begin with safety. That's level A data. Safety meaning uh, removing sharp objects from the bedroom area, barricading furniture. Um, a year ago when I gave the same seminar uh, of Ramsey behavior disorder in the morning, um, I had a gentleman who, um, was an FBI agent and he, part of his dream enactment was he had his gun under the pillow and he woke up one, night, one morning and found that there were three bullet uh, holes in the ceiling and he had no idea how it happened, only to realize that he must have fired the gun uh, during his uh, dream enactment spell. So rule number one, 
safety, removing sharp objects, barricading the floor, barricading furniture. Pharmacologic treatment is usually recommended when the episodes are dramatic, frequent, uh, and disrupt the patient's uh, sleep. And the fourth C, as I've mentioned, is clonazepam. Clonazepam has 90% efficacy, and melatonin is also very effective, probably slightly more effective than clonazepam, given that it's also over-the-counter, and also avoidance of any aggravating medications like SSRIs, alcohol, sleep deprivation. Now, um, I have this uh, device that I want to show you, and this is actually from, um, based on the fact that RBD, patients with RBD have a very low auditory threshold uh, during, during REM sleep. And essentially what the device does is it records the bed partner's uh, voice telling the patient to calmly go back to sleep. And this is what it sounds like. So if the patient is having an episode, the device is triggered, and it sounds like this. Honey, you just had a bad dream. It's okay. Go back to sleep. Okay, so that's the wife telling the patient everything's fine. And it's, again, triggered by movement or by changes in position that are, is quite uh, violent. And this is what, it sh what I want to show you on the video. And here we need the video a little high. In, can we turn up the volume on this video? <laughs> okay, the episode is gone. So again, um, very interesting in that just the sound of the bed partner during REM sleep is sufficient to reduce the frequency of episodes. And this is courtesy of Dr. Mike Howell from University of Minnesota. Lastly, let's, let's talk about the conversation. We know that there is a risk for neurodegenerative disease, particularly the alpha semiclinopathies, and RBD really represents the tip of the iceberg where neurodegeneration is what may happen in the future. And really, uh, the data, this is the most recent data from the Barcelona group, and it shows uh, a Kaplan-Meier uh, data showing years after RBD diagnosis on the x-axis, number of a uh, neurologic free survival on the y-axis, and you can see, and again, this is the automatic rewind, you can see that uh, within five years, about a third of patients will develop RBD. Within uh, 10 years, about two-thirds, and almost all patients after 14 years will develop uh, an alpha synuclinopathy. So, um, Really, I think in the last uh, 15 minutes, I gave you a very basic overview of a very intriguing, complex, and, and a, a fascinating sleep disorder that I think is very, um, uh, is not only rewarding for us as physicians to be able to treat, but really rewarding for the patients because many of them don't know what this condition is and what it entails. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we now have NeuroLearn RBD that just went live on Wednesday, I believe, right? And uh, it has uh, close to 15 separate videos of experts in the field of sleep medicine talking about RBD. It has some uh, nice videos of patients going through the pathophysiology, diagnosis, management, and prognosis, and thanks to Maureen. Uh, who is uh, in charge of the NeuroLearn program, we've been able to make this available in time for the AN. So if anyone is interested, I have some handouts here about how you can sign up for NeuroLearn. And for all AN members, this is, this is free for registration. So thanks so much for your attention. I'm going to be around if there are any questions. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>